Now, could you potentially be on birth control without really being aware of it? Today, we're going to discuss soy. Now, what's so bad about soy? I mean, it's a health food product. It's in a lot of our foods. Um, it's good for the heart. It's good to help prevent breast cancer. And in Asia, they do tons of soy, right? It can't be that bad. I mean, if you just look at the research, I mean, you'll see tons of study on the first five pages of Google uh, endorsing soy as the next miracle food. Well, um, I want to share some information from a very interesting book that I am reading right now. It's called The Whole Soy Story by Dr. Kayla Daniel. She has her PhD in nutritional sciences, as well as being a certified clinical nutritionist. So I'm going to put the link for her book down below, as well as all the research I'm going to talk about. Well, here's the thing about soy. Soy um, acts very similar to estradiol, okay, in our bodies. Now, yes, it is a, a thousand times weaker. However, it has a much higher affinity for our receptors than our own estrogen, which means it can easily bind to these estrogen receptors and create some physiological responses. So soy does create an estrogenic effect on our bodies. So for people to say that the science is settled, don't look at this, it's, we already know it's safe. You might wanna just take another look at what I'm gonna share with you. Now, as far as in Asia, it is true that they consume maybe more soy. However, it's used as a condiment. It's not used as their main food. And it's usually always in the form of a fermented soy product, nato, miso, tofu, and they don't actually use the form of soy that we use in America, like soy protein isolates, hydrolyzed soy proteins, and the highly refined soy oil, which is in, oh my gosh, it's in hummus, it's in salad dressing, it's in a lot of your foods. It's actually even in oatmeal. They put it in sodas. I mean, it is like all over our foods. Now, it is true that the Japanese um, have a lower rate of breast cancer. However, they have a higher rate of other cancers that Americans don't have. So if you really look at the research on soy, there's a lot of mixed um, conclusions, uh, mainly based on who's sponsoring the study. So let's just go through this. Uh, 1994, there was a, an article written by the American Dietetic Association that stated that women trying to conceive uh, should avoid excessive soy. And they recommended having less than 60 grams a day. Now, some people are going to say, well, those are older studies. Well, actually, there's probably more integrity of some of these older studies than there is nowadays because they can make a study come out any way that they want. Now, if you look at the physiology, and this was done in animal studies, um, soy can give an estrogenic effect that can greatly affect uh, follicle stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone. These are the two hormones that are sent from the pituitary down to your gonads, and they regulate estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So if you're going to suppress follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, you're going to have a less release of the egg from the ovary. And that's going to make you more infertile. It's also going to affect the menstrual cycle. You may find your menstrual cycle going longer. You may find your menstrual cycle actually not even occurring. In another study, which I'll put down below, in the thumbnail sketch, the study said that there was a less probability of giving birth. In a, in a male study, there was shown to be lower sperm count, uh, decreased erections, uh, decreased libido, um, hot flashes, increase in breast tissue in male bodies, nipple discharge, and lowered testosterone. I mean, if you think about who consumes the most soy on a regular basis, it's in the monasteries. The monks in the monasteries consume a tremendous amount of soy. And I think the reason they do it is because it helps curb libido. Now, the other thing that's interesting, and it's hard to find data on this topic, is that 70% of all the soy grown is used in animal feeds. So who knows what that's doing to our animals? I know it's in dog food. It's in cat food. It's actually even in fish food. And uh, the reason I'm talking about that is because we have animals now on, on my farm, and it's very difficult to find feed that is soy free. Now, the most problematic thing that I see with soy is in the soy based uh, infant formulas. So you're going to give soy to an infant, the amount of soy that you're going to expose this infant to is between six to nine milligrams per kilogram 
of weight per day. So there's been links to higher body weight. I mean, estrogen is an anabolic hormone. It makes things get bigger. And in some of these infant formulas, there's an equivalent estrogen, if you compare their body weight to an adult, of taking roughly three to five birth control pills a day. Not to mention a lot of these infants have allergies to soy and uh, digestive issues. And as far as the quality of protein, it's not the best quality. This is why it's so important to um, encourage a mother to breastfeed. Now, soy in general is also linked to hypothyroidism, endocrine problems, digestive issues, and the list goes on and on. So I really suggest you should start to read labels. Okay, start reading labels. Um, like even like when you get hummus, right? When the first ingredient is soy oil, try to find a dressing with other oils than soy oil or corn oil. Unfortunately, most of the soy out there is GMO. And I think globally, we're in this huge experiment of soy. Many of these um, problematic ingredients um, show up years later. So I think it's really important to see the other side of soy, look at the pros and the cons, and then decide for yourself. Now, if you have not seen my video on estrogen dominance, I'm going to put it up right here. Check it out.